Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm glad you can join us uh, for our discussion about Mars, the Perseverance Rover, what lies ahead. Uh, my name is Brian Berger. I'm the editor in chief of Space News. We have a great uh, group of panelists with us today. And in order to introduce everybody, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff Faust. Thanks, Brian. Uh, this is Jeff Faust, senior staff writer at Space News. Uh, thanks for everybody for tuning in to our webinar on uh, Blueprint for Red Planet. Uh, we're going to start off with a little bit of discussion of the Mars 2020 mission and Mars sample return and how that extends into planning for human missions to Mars. And we're going to start off with Ken Farley, the uh, chief scientist for the Mars 2020 mission. Uh, maybe, Ken, you can start off right now uh, giving us an update on the mission and the uh, new launch date. Uh, let's start with the with the first slide. We've got a uh, uh, a, a rover that is. Do I have the first slide? Yes. One second. I've got a pin yeah. it. Okay. Now we're good. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, we start with a with a rover that is similar to uh, Curiosity. Um, we can talk more as we go along on the on the goals of the mission. But this is essentially a, a mission with three goals: uh, astrobiology. Mars sample return, and enabling the future by testing new technology. So we'll, we'll talk about that. But first, let me get right to the, the most uh, newsworthy uh, aspects of this uh, mission right now. If we go to the next slide, we have some images that were just taken in the last few days from uh, the assembly facility uh, at the Cape. And uh, we are now uh, a little, little bit more than a month, actually less than a month away from launch. And so you see images uh, here of the rover uh, and the descent stage being encapsulated in the aero shell. And above that is the cruise stage. So this is the assembly of the spacecraft. Next slide. And here you see the whole spacecraft being uh, uh, encapsulated is starting to go into the fairing. So the blue thing in the background is the fairing. That is now complete. The spacecraft is now encapsulated. And uh, the next step in the process is to uh, get it onto the rocket. We have the next slide. The fairing was recently painted with the Mars 2020 logo. So for us on the team, this is a very exciting moment. The spacecraft is uh, essentially done from the, from the JPL perspective. We've got a few more things that have to happen, but uh, all is in good shape uh, for that. Um, Last week, there was, a, uh, there was an announcement made that the launch date, which was originally scheduled for July 17th, um, had been moved back a few days. And there was an additional announcement today that it had been moved back a, a few days uh, for uh, reasons that are associated with the ground support equipment at, uh, um, at the launch facility. So there's no, no issue with the spacecraft. The current launch date that we are uh, aiming for, the opening of the window, is on July 22nd uh, at about 9.30 in the morning. Great. So what can we look forward to in the, uh, what's coming up in terms of major milestones between now and the launch on the 22nd? Got a question for me? So, yeah. so I, I don't know the details, to be honest. I don't know the details of, uh, of the process from, from here out. I, I uh, assume that the spacecraft gets, uh, the encapsulated spacecraft, but gets put on the launch vehicle and, and then gets uh, rolled out for launch. All right. Uh, Jim Watson uh, is director of the Mars Exploration Program at NASA. Uh, Mars 2020 is really the, the first step in uh, Mars sample return. Um, you know, this has been a, a long-awaited, long-desired milestone for, uh, for planetary scientists and, and others involved in Mars exploration. Tell us a little bit, what comes next after Mars 2020? What are, there's two missions coming up later in the decade to pick up the samples that Mars 2020 is going to cache and bring them back to Earth. Where do we stand in terms of the planning for those two missions? Might uh, Jim, can you hear us? It's like we might have lost Jim. 
Hey, well, we wait for that. If, if uh, I, I could uh, say a little bit about how 2020 is going to play into Mars sample returns. Sure. If you'd like. So, so the, the Mars 2020 mission is um, uh, conceived as the first step in a series of missions uh, that could bring samples back to Earth. And in particular, Mars 2020 is tasked with collecting uh, the, the scientifically selected samples. And uh, we will collect uh, about 35 uh, samples that each weigh about 15 grams. And you should picture a um, cylinder of rock cored from the, from the planet's surface, uh, about the size and shape of a piece of chalkboard chalk, if that's a familiar analogy. So we will collect those from a variety of locations around the landing site to um, uh, address a, a, a big diversity of scientific questions that really require us to have samples in terrestrial laboratories. And one of the really key questions that uh, is almost impossible to answer with a, with a uh, spaceborne instrumentation is the definitive uh, uh, documentation of life beyond Earth. That has such a huge burden of proof. That we don't really expect to be able to do that with instruments that are presently flyable. And this actually makes the logical connection between Mars 2020 being an astrobiology-focused mission, looking for life that it might have existed on the planet billions of years ago, and sample return. So we'll collect samples from habitable ancient environments and bring them back to Earth and, and let the, the, the future missions will bring them back to Earth. And uh, this will allow us to use the whole terrestrial laboratory arsenal to investigate those samples. Great. Um, you know, you've got, I think, a, a few dozen of these um, sample caching tubes on the rover. How are you going to decide what samples to collect uh, along the way? What's the process for determining that particular rock or, or that particular outcrop is the one that you want to collect a sample from to bring back to Earth? Yeah, that's really a great question. This is a, this is a finite resource, and uh, the, the science team will have to make the decisions in real time. Do we want to collect this rock or do we want to collect that rock? We want to drive on and find a better outcrop. Um, so we've started the process already. The science team has been investigating the very detailed orbital imagery that we have and the orbital mineralogy that's been collected by spacecraft over the, uh, the last couple of decades. And so we've identified where the key outcrops are and considered what we could do with them. And if we could go to uh, the third, the, I guess it's the first image after the uh, the update from ATLO, there's an image of where we're going to land. And I think it illustrates very nicely a, a target. Um, so the landing site that we're going to is called Jezero Crater. And the fascinating thing about Jezero Crater is it once hosted uh, a very large lake, a lake about the size of Lake Tahoe, had an inflow channel and an outflow channel. Uh, Brian, are you trying to call up that image? I can um, do that for you. And Okay, and at the, uh, at the inflow channel where the, where the canyon comes into this former lake, it's a very large delta, a place where the sediment that was carried by the river was deposited on the lake floor. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna get you to pause for a second. So I've got to grab, I got to grab the, the spotlight, so to speak, in order to uh, share the video. But you can go now, so um, I'll trans transition back over to your slides. Okay. Yeah, next one. Perfect. Okay, so this is a, uh, a uh, uh, image stitched together from MRO images. And uh, what you see in the, in the background is the crater rim, the circular feature that is arcing from, from uh, left to right, and the canyon that drains into this former lake, and the big blob in the center with the crater right in the middle of it, that's a delta. And this is a wonderfully habitable environment. This is a kind of place that... Uh, at the same time, so this is a th about a three and a half billion year old feature. Three and a half billion years ago on Earth, features like this were inhabited. So we have a situation where environments that were similar on Earth and Mars, in, on the case, in case of the Earth, these environments are inhabited. And so there's a, there's a, a reasonable proposition uh, that this was a habitable environment. And this, so this is going to be one of the key places that we will go and investigate and collect samples from in, in the hopes of uh, a series of missions bringing them back. Great. 
Um, thanks. Uh, looks like we've got uh, Jim Watson, director of the Mars Exploration Program back. Um, wouldn't be a, a webcast without some sort of technical glitch along the way. Uh, I um, Jim, you know, Mars 2020 is the beginning of this Mars sample return campaign, and there are going to be two missions that are, are planned to follow to actually pick up the samples that Mars 2020 caches and brings them back to Earth. Where do we stand in terms of the planning for those two missions, and what sort of milestones are coming up in terms of their, their, their formulation and development? So this mission uh, that we're getting ready to launch that Ken described in just a few weeks from now has gotten doubly exciting because it is the first leg of Mars sample return. We've been working really hard over the last several years with ESA uh, to develop a partnership so we could share the burden of the remaining two missions that it takes to bring home the samples from that will be uh, collected and cached by the Perseverance rover here. So we have in the past year uh, drawn together an architecture for the next two missions. We've divided up the responsibilities between NASA and ESA according to where our, our experience bases and technical strengths lie. Uh, we have drawn up all of the documents to cement that relationship and formalize that relationship. ESA has taken the proposal to participate in this to their ministerial council back in November and they got approval and the budget to support the sample return campaign. And NASA has been fortunate in the, in the past two years to get appropriated budget to begin the pre-formulation studies and the planning of Mars sample return. So we are right now working towards a, a goal of being ready to launch in 2026, the remaining two legs of sample return to go collect those samples and bring them back to Earth for a landing in 2031. So we're really excited that we can not only launch the first leg, we are beginning the development phase of the next two legs. And I can uh, describe if you'd like uh, what sure. this consists of. And then Brian, if you could bring up the, the chart that shows the three elements of sample return. Sure thing, sure. let me just grab the video for you. Okay. Well, before the video, get the static chart that has the three elements. Got it, one second. There we go. All right, just, press ahead. Yeah. Okay. This one you want? No, no, keep going. That's the title okay. chart. One more. All right. There we go. So there's three elements to the sample return campaign. What we want worked real hard to do is to break this down into missions that were of the size and scale and scope that we knew how to execute, that we had uh, relevant experience base, both at NASA and in the industry and over at ESA and their supporting industry. So the Mars 2020 rover is the first leg. It goes, it searches for, it characterizes the local environment, it collects the samples, and then it has an operational decision to make as to whether to hold on to the samples or to deposit the samples in a cache on the surface for future retrieval. It takes us to the second element of the mission, which is another lander. And that lander will be uh, carrying a precious payload, uh, the Mars Ascent Vehicle, to launch the samples back into Mars orbit. And also a small fetch rover, about two-thirds the size of the MER rovers, uh, that is provided by ESA. So the fetch rover is designed to uh, leave the lander and retrieve the cache that's placed on the surface. And Mars 2020, has the capability to hold samples and then of course drive to where the lander is and deliver samples. So we have a dual strategy for retrieving the samples and getting them over to the lander, at which point these samples get transferred into uh, the payload compartment of the launch vehicle, which I'll, I'll show you in a little bit, uh, that's uh, in the center of this lander and will be launched into uh, Mars orbit. Once it's in Mars orbit, then you have to rendezvous with that sample container and there's an orbiter that will be going. It's uh, has this sole responsibility of rendezvousing and capturing those sample container to uh, secure it in containment uh, from a, a planetary protection perspective. And then it'll then leave Mars orbit and bring those samples back to earth at which point an entry vehicle will be deployed and it'll go through an atmospheric entry and bring the, uh, uh, the samples to the surface for uh, retrieval and taken to the laboratories there. 
So the way we, we've broken up responsibilities is the 2020 rover is of course developed by NASA, but we have a lot of international collaboration on that. The sample retrieval lander is NASA's responsibility and the MAV is NASA's responsibility, but the fetch rover is ESA's responsibility. And there's a robotic arm that'll transfer the samples that are retrieved and load them into the Mars Ascent Vehicle, and that's an ESA responsibility. The Earth Return Orbiter is an ESA responsibility. And in fact, they've just been uh, in the process of negotiating and signing the contracts with their, uh, their vendors over in Europe to begin the development work on this orbiter uh, just in this month of June here. Uh, but they, uh, they provide the orbiter and all of its fundamental capabilities to go to Mars, capture in Mars orbit, to provide the rendezvous, and then to leave Mars orbit and return the samples. And NASA will be providing the halo that goes on this orbiter that does the actual capture function with the uh, contained samples, uh, does the containment function, loads them into the Earth entry vehicle, and then, uh, and, and then the Earth entry vehicle, uh, of course, uh, brings the samples down on the final leg, return leg. If we go to the next, uh, next chart, Brian, I can walk you through a video so you can see how functionally this all comes together. And what's really interesting and exciting about this, this is, you know, in the big picture, this is humanity's first trip, round trip to another planet. And it begins with Mars 2020. Uh, we're going to land this rover with the sky crane, just as we did with MSL. And it is equipped with uh, quite a complement of instruments and tools to go pursue uh, the identification of good samples and the collection of samples. Here you see the, uh, the drill mechanism that'll drill and load the samples into the tubes. And th this is what the tubes would look like if they are deposited on the surface for a later collection, about the size of a good cigar tube. Earth return orbiter goes in the fall of 26 and heads on its trajectory to Mars. It gets there in about uh, seven or eight months, uh, but it is using electric propulsion and it'll spend the better part of the next year, year and a quarter, adjusting the orbit to get down into an operational position in the summer of 2028. So it'll be prepared to support the next lander. The lander launch is actually a few months before the orbiter in the summer of 26. Uh, takes the scenic route, if you will, to Mars and lands in August of 2028. And it'll be a static lander, but it'll use the entry techniques that we've used for Curiosity and for Mars 2020, the parachute, the air braking, the, the parachute, and then retro rockets. It'll deploy the fetch rover which will go and retrieve those samples that we make the operational decision to leave on the, on the surface. And it'll bring those back to the lander. And I should point out this task is doable because we intend to increase the landing accuracy of the lander uh, yet another order of magnitude better than what we're gonna do on Mars 2020. We have to thermally protect the, uh, the ascent vehicle and the propulsion system, so it's in a thermal shroud. Here you see that it opened up, you see the nose cone opened up and the transfer arm will then take the samples uh, from a rack that's on the front of the fetch rover and load them into uh, the payload container, the orbiting sample container is what we call it. That's about the size of a basketball. So you can kind of visualize what we're dealing with here. And we hope to be able to fill that with at least 30 samples. Uh, meanwhile, in parallel, we'll have the uh, Perseverance rover making its way back into the actual landing site for the lander. And so you can see this is a cooperative integrated activity, sort of a ballet of the three missions that have to be coordinated. And it'll drive up to the lander and it'll drop the samples into a container that'll be at the end of the outstretched arm, uh, the transfer arm that I showed you a little earlier, and then ultimately picked from that transfer container and, and loaded into the ascent vehicle. And I think our video has frozen, Brian, here we go. So okay. once delivered, uh, the rovers will back off, will launch the ascent vehicle, and it, it's on its way to a low Mars orbit, a circular orbit, probably something on the order of 400 to 500 kilometers in altitude. 
And this will be launched in the manner that the entire launch process, including the deployment of the orbiting sample container can be overseen by the orbiter. Uh, we'll then take uh, significantly more time than what it just illustrated there, probably a month or so to do the closing and the rendezvous with that. And this is a cross section of the payload that NASA is providing on the orbiter. So we basically capture the container, if you will, in a bucket. We sweep it into an area where we can control and set the orientation. We then put it into a braised seal uh, container, and then we load it into the earth entry vehicle, which you see depicted here at the top of the, uh, of the payload stack. It's behind a micrometeorite shield. We jettison the robotic system, that's extra weight, to facilitate departure from Mars in 2029. And that begins a two-year journey on the return back to Earth, again, using the electric propulsion system. So as we get close to Earth, um, we will orient and align the, the, uh, the vector to deploy the entry vehicle. And then the orbiter will divert and fly by Earth into a heliocentric orbit. And then we have a fully ballistic landing here, coming into uh, one of the desert landing ranges in the western United States. There's no parachute on the landing. Uh, that's a fault mode that we would have to survive, so we decided just to forego the chute. And we have shock absorption designed within the entry vehicle. And it'll be picked up and then sent to the uh, facility for our study by a whole lot of excited scientists as we get the, uh, the treasure that we have sought for decades now, and that's actual samples of Mars. So that's the campaign that we have planned out. That's the architecture. I described the roles in both organizations are proceeding full steam ahead. In terms of NASA's uh, role in this, uh, we're preparing for a concept review in the August timeframe. And uh, our KDPA, which is the uh, agency uh, gate review process uh, that formalizes and approves our entry in the, into a formulation phase that will occur in September of this year. So we're on track for the 26th launch date. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I wanted to bring in uh, Rick Davis, uh, Assistant Director of Science and Exploration at NASA Headquarters. Uh, we've been hearing a lot about Mars 2020 and Mars sample return. NASA's made clear that the, you know, the ultimate long-term goal is humans to Mars. How do these missions fit into supporting that long-term goal? Hi, Jeff. It's uh, good to see you again. And uh, let's go, if we can, uh, Brian, to, we'll just hop straight to my slide um, eight, if we can do that, please. Uh, okay, let me grab these for you. Thank you. And we will just skip forward. So, um, Back one. Let me one back one. Yeah, okay. if you would please. Perfect. So um, we, I, uh, uh, I don't know where I start. Okay. So on this slide, we started five years ago to actually begin the process of picking a landing site or base location on Mars. At the, at the time of that workshop, which was really very uh, uh, eye-opening. We, uh, the major focus was on a better understanding water feedstocks at Mars. Fortunately, Mars has lots of water, but over the time, we have gotten a lot smarter about other things that we really need to know about the planet to uh, enable human spaceflight to Mars and to, um, uh, and, and to make it more productive. And if you will see over in the upper left-hand corner, Jeff, there's Mars sample return. And you'll see that the first thing it does, is it makes the first round trip demonstration, which is, as Jim's talk just described, a very complicated thing. It's going to be a lot more complicated for human spaceflight. But just getting the first Mars ascent vehicle experience done, doing an orbital rendezvous at Mars, these are all, and then returning to Earth and understanding the trade there is really key. Those samples are also important for a number of other reasons. Uh, so, for example, they shed insight into the mechanical properties of the dirt or regolith. And as you probably well know, on, on the lunar missions, lunar uh, dirt or regolith 
is is very abrasive. And in fact, on Apollo 17, had they gone out for one more moon walk, and no, I didn't say spacewalk because they are on the moon and they're dealing with dust and a lot of other pro- challenges. Uh, they could very well have uh, compromised the suit. That's a nice way of saying it had a major leak, which could have put the crew at risk. And so the point being is that that what was happening was that the dirt on the moon is acting like glass shards and slicing through the suit. Um, And we really need to better understand that that risk. We need to understand how dust, dust, uh, what we're dealing with there in terms of not only uh, suits, but also in terms of seals and so many other interfaces that affect the viability of these uh, this equipment that's supporting the crew. If uh, dust is the wrong size, it actually can act like asbestos and get stuck in the lungs. And so getting better insight, which Mars Sample Return provides, is, is really key. So there are, these are just some of the reasons where it, this whole sequence, amazing sequence of missions that Jim just described, uh, actually uh, 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 teaches us how to do that. In the middle of the page, there, this is the water story which I'm going to hit on these really briefly because this really kind of tells sort of a a, a a more comprehensive view, is that we really out of the first landing site workshop from uh, human operations at Mars, what we realized is that it's water, water, water. And so this is the next big thrust. And so understanding where, where those water resources are and what it takes to produce from them is critical. And there's basically two types of water at Mars. There, are, Mars fortunately had we, um, we found out in the last 15-ish years has whole buried deposits of water, probably oceans and so forth, glaciers that are there, and they're largely covered by uh, uh, regolith or dirt again. Um, or uh, and so we need to better understand exactly where they are and how close to the equator they come because we know that as you get closer to the equator, it gets warmer. And, uh, uh, and, and so the whole game becomes figuring out how close they are there and in sufficient deposits uh, so that we can actually find them. And then there's also another type of water where you have water molecules locked up in um, uh, w- w- dirt or rocks. Uh, those are very challenging because you have to uh, bake it out. And also there's some issues that we are learning about finding it. So and eventually, though, we know we need another uh, orbiter to go with a radar that has the right frequencies for the ice story that we now know exists and to really nail down where those deposits are. Uh, and that is uh, what the uh, president's budget just recently proposed, which is an ice mapper mission to go really narrow that down. And eventually we're going to need to go access that water, much like we're bringing back samples um, uh, and really understand what's in there chemically and potentially biologically. Um, and then uh, uh, I just hit on the last few ones. Uh, other things that we've now begun to realize that sort of play on these themes is we need to dramatically increase the amount of high resolution imaging that we have of the planet. We have only about 4% of the planet done in high res imaging. Um, and that's been a challenge because of the data pipe back from Mars to Earth. Um, for human operations, we're going to need a lot more. And so really getting that back. And then that leads to the next point, which is that we have done amazing things that the human species has done amazing things at Mars with a very limited pipeline. Um, it's amazing what that pipeline does, but we really are uh, seeing uh, that the science and reconnaissance uh, that we can do, reconnaissance being what we need for human space out there, can be dramatically improved by going to a, a communications infrastructure that mimics more what we do at Earth, where we have geosynchronous satellites. Um, that are, you know, have a visibility of large chunks of the planet, and our ability to pump data back from our second planet to our home planet will be dramatically improved. And there are really a lot of innovative ideas out there now that can actually make that possible. And if you slide over a little bit, please, to the right. Um, then the last major thrust is really understanding whether we do not want to be landing in major dust storms. We lost uh, the rover opportunity in the last major dust storm. It was dependent on solar arrays uh, to keep for its power. But in general, landing in dust storms is bad news. 
we probably need to understand density profiles better to handle these large human uh, class landers that we're talking about. And finally, you know, one of the big reasons you go to Mars is to search for life. Um, and we do not want to be mixing the human biology that human beings will be taking with them uh, as they explore our second planet. And doing it. so understanding how uh, uh, biological releases uh, uh, transport in the Martian atmosphere with winds and whatnot is really key to understanding it. And in Antarctica, they do similar types of investigations and they know the prevailing winds and they keep areas that are clean so that uh, 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 searches for extremophiles. Uh, or with this, uh, or uh, microbial, life, you know, particularly interesting microbial life, or in the case of Mars, potentially uh, um, uh, alien into, uh, life forms, microbial, uh, are real. We can preserve that while having human beings there. And so, getting smarter about the weather is key. But again, Mars sample return, of which 2020, uh, the perseverance is a the first major element is is really a key piece of this going forward, and hopefully that gives you a kind of a broad brush view of how we're viewing uh, um, this playing into human space flight. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, that's a great overview. <clears throat> uh, let uh, my colleague uh, Leonard David uh, ask some questions, but first remind viewers that uh, if you have questions of your own, there's the Q and A button down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, be sure to use that and not the chat button if you want to ask questions. We're we'll trying to uh, reserve some time towards the end of the hour to get some audience questions in. But uh, Leonard. Well, uh, thanks for everybody to uh, put this together. This is pretty informative. I think, you know, uh, one uh, curmudgeon uh, question I have to ask, uh, uh, going through the Viking uh, program in the 70s, you know, we've got a lot tied with this Mars 2020 rover, and Mars can be mean. We could lose the mission. What happens, what is a ripple effect of not having that mission succeed? Uh, it seems like we have a lot riding on this for, for today and the future. Uh, any comments on that? Yeah, I, I, I can start. Um, we, when we are um, collecting the samples, we drill them into these sample tubes and we put them inside the, the body of the rover. But we have the capability to put the samples down anywhere we wish, at any time we wish. And this was uh, considered necessary for the very reason that you're getting at, that there's a lot at stake with that cargo. And so the intention of this very flexible design is to allow us to make the decision of uh, putting down a, a collection of samples, which we call a depot, as a target for the future missions. So uh, we will, um, as, as Jim showed, we can carry some on board the rover to the lander. Uh, that would that would require an extended extended mission for uh, for perseverance, but by the end of the prime mission, I expect that we will have laid down a target uh, a cache for the for the future missions, so that they actually are guaranteed that they have a, a, a set of samples to go after. Yes, yeah, so I'll comment from Jim there. Sure, I'll add to that. So we we've tried to be sensitive to mitigate as many uh, single fault. Uh, or pinch points, if you will, in the architecture. So Ken talked about uh, making sure that we have a collection of samples that will be available for the next step. The dual rover strategy addresses the, uh, the fault possibilities in the retrieval aspect of the mission. So that if we get the samples from both rovers, then we'll have the best choice of samples to load into the ascent vehicle. If we only have one, uh, we tend to enforce operational strategies that make sure either one is a scientifically compelling set, subset of samples that we can bring back. Of course, just like here on Earth, when you get to launch point, that's a pinch point and a single fault issue. If, if you have a launch failure, uh, there's always a big setback there. But uh, once we get uh, the container inserted into Mars orbit, we chose an orbit that is naturally sustainable for several decades. So if there is an issue uh, with finding that container, if there's an issue with the orbiter, 
in the process of rendezvousing if there's an issue with the orbit around station uh, that prevents it from completing the rest of the activities. The samples will be safe in Mars orbit until we can mount another orbiter to go uh, perform that rendezvous and bring them back. But of course, once you've loaded it on a orbiter and you've departed Mars, you're at a, you're at a single point, uh, pinch point that is really not avoidable. Um, and the lander, of course, is, a, is another pinch point there. But we tried to give ourselves flexibility as much as we could in the design of the architecture and the strategies of how we plan to operate. Perhaps, perhaps for Ken, one of the things that's fascinating about Mars is that question, is there life on Mars? That drove us there with Viking in 1976. And here we are in 2020 asking the same question. And one wonders, you know, uh, do we have the right instruments? Are we asking the right questions with the right instruments? I mean, what has to happen in the near term about our instrumentation that we can get this answer? You know, how do you see that evolving? Well, let me, let me make two points. Uh, the first is, as far as we know, there is nowhere on the surface of Mars, and I'm being very careful to say on the surface, that is habitable by any known terrestrial organism. So the idea that there might be life on the surface readily accessible, which was the Viking concept, um, that is not um, widely believed to be possible. So in, in thinking about how we might investigate for life, uh, the, the thing that we draw on is the fact that it's very clear from the geologic setting of Mars that it was once very different. Right now, it's too cold, it's too dry, it's too much radiation on the surface for any life as we know. But if you look at the planet uh, about three and a half billion years ago, there were lakes and rivers. So what's different is we're going to look at a different time. And then, as I said, I think if, it, you know, we could, we could fly lots of instruments but we don't know what we're looking for. So how do you, if you're, if you're looking at ancient rocks, what exactly should you look for, for life that might be different than terrestrial life? I think that's a very tall order, but it is something that is sort of the natural thing you would do if you brought sap samples back. We have lots of capabilities and we could use them in series or in parallel as we investigate the samples. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the logical connection, that not, not trying to do it with flown instruments alone. Yeah, I think, I think Leonard too is, you know, you look at the strategy the program has set out over the last 15 years, 20 years, uh, we wanted to be very methodical in the search for life. Um, Viking was, was hoping that they would find something that would be prevalent on the surface and they would uh, be able to detect life. And we've since learned that the surface is actually quite a hostile environment as Ken mentioned. So we stood back and we said, well, let's be a little bit methodical about how we investigate the possibility of life. The first thing we need to do is understand the evolution of the planet better and determine whether it was ever habitable. And if it was habitable, where was it habitable? And that's what we've been uh, focusing on and with the sort of the follow the water strategy, if you will, that has unfolded over the last 15 years, both with the orbiters and the reconnaissance and then the rovers that we put on the surface. So as Ken laid out, the landing site we picked for 2020 was clearly habitable. Uh, at one point in time, it had the right conditions, right? The th right thermal conditions, the right water conditions. Uh, the atmosphere was probably robust at that point in time at Mars. And so now we're gonna look for ancient signs of life, preserved uh, fossilized evidence of ancient life, if you will, because it's no longer habitable on the surface now. But as we go and, and have discovered through our reconnaissance that there are vast reservoirs of ice on Mars, some not too far from the surface. And we've examined uh, imagery from fresh impact craters that uh, make that very obvious all the way down into the mid latitudes, maybe even lower. Um, once we can map the distribution of that ice that's not too far below the surface, the next obvious question will be continuing the theme of follow the water Let's go look where the ice is. And so we, this is not something that we're going to have um, an immediate answer with any one mission, but we've been trying to 
identify and follow the path of the highest probability with a sequential increase in our capabilities. And perseverance is, is the next big step when we actually bring the samples home to expose them to modern, modern instrumentation. Thanks, Jim. Uh, maybe for Rick, last thing, uh, just a quick thing. Just what clarify a little bit, uh, you got to it, I think, but it, it is really interesting thinking about the data pipeline of what we're really gonna need uh, in the future with human explore, explorers on the planet. Are we talking laser links? Are we talking, what is it that you think uh, we'll see in the, in the future? Uh, Leonard, thank you. Good to see you again. And uh, great question. Thank you. Uh, so what we, we see steps, uh, first of all, right now, COM is relayed through orbiters that are um, in low Mars orbit, you know, like 300 kilometers or something like that. Um, and the problem with that is that your line of sight uh, to, uh, to, say, surface assets is very limited during the day. You get, you know, maybe 20 minute passes and then you're having to uh, try to relay everything to there. On the Earth, we don't really do that. What we do is we actually will often use things like geosynchronous satellites that are parked over a set spot on the Earth. That's why we choose those orbits, so that we can just pump data up all the time. Or we go to constellations, uh, you know, these uh, cases where they've got lots of birds, like these, um, like the Starlink system that, say, SpaceX is deploying, where they've got lots, I'm not talking thousands, ultimately, that basically do the same thing, provide you with uh, constant coverage. Um, and so by m putting in a small constellation, say three satellites in an equatorial orbit, you can achieve a dramatic improvement in the total uh, communications capability at Mars and being able to relay to, uh, to back to Earth. And you really need to think about science, and I, I think reconnaissance, because that's the thing we worry about, is the stuff we need to know about for human space flight as an investment. And if you, you know, increase the number uh, the amount of data you get back by two orders of magnitude, that means the return on an investment is, goes up almost by two orders of magnitude because you're just getting that much data back that amazing scientists on this planet and students all over will be able to study and really analyze. And there are a lot of other things that have become possible. So for, just to give you two, one thing that we're challenged on doing right now is if you see a very cool thing that is changing over time, it is very hard to temporally look at that on repeat passes and really understand what, what's changing with the, with the uh, uh, tight data pipe that we have right now. If you go to a more robust comm system, that changes. And the very exciting thing is what we call small missions, but you, you know that could include CubeSats, that could include micro landers. And if we have a real comm system at Mars, the ability to send university design uh, satellites or you know, smaller ones that in, in, in new uh, countries or space agencies entering the thing, they don't have to build the whole complicated thing. They can leverage this other infrastructure that they're like we have on our home planet um, and to achieve amazing science sooner than later. And so the comm pipe is a really critical part for uh, doing it. And some of these things, like the next generation radar, we need to really understand where the water resources are on Mars or where we want to put a drill to go explore for the potential for life that Jim was just talking about. Those are big data volume sensors that have, where you really want to send lots of raw data back to the Earth. And we're just going to need a different paradigm for how we ship that much data back. Eventually, we'll feed in what we call laser comp or optical com, um, and so that will also give us a big jump, but just by, but just by going to a more uh, Earth-typical communications infrastructure at Mars will be transformative. Thanks a lot. Very good. Maybe back to Jeff or Brian. Yeah, let me, I'll, I'll get a question here. I've, I've seen variations of this question on the chat, and um, not surprising. Um, so it comes down to the, the question of planetary protection. And that's nothing new for Mars missions. We've done planetary protection front to protect Mars from Earth microbes for a long time. Mars sample return, though, introduces the complication of protecting Earth from anything that might be coming back from Mars. And for Jim, um, how do you implement sort of that two-way forward and backward uh, contamination protection? Uh, and then also, once the samples are back to Earth, 
um, they arrive back in that sample canister, what happens to them um, to both, you know, protect them, but give uh, scientists access to them? Okay, that was a, a great questions. Um, we didn't have time to get into the, the details of the architecture, but that cross section I showed you of the payload on the orbiter, and I sort of described how we process the sample container once we rendezvous on orbit, you would see that as a, as a container is drawn inside, it's essentially drawn into a clean chamber. And then we braze, a metallic braze, a, a two hemispheres, if you will, of a container around that container that we just rendezvoused with in that sterile environment. And in that sterile environment, in the process of brazing, everything on the outside is heated and sterilized. We then move that, that container into a redundant mechanical container uh, that is secured with uh, more classical seals. And then for the third layer, it is bolted into the earth entry vehicle structure itself. Then the entry vehicle is designed, uh, as I showed, to safely land and take the impact of uh, landing with no parachute whatsoever and absorb that shock. When, it, when that vehicle is retrieved, uh, it'll be taken to a biosecure facility, and that's where we will eventually unpack it, if you will, remove it from the entry vehicle, and start taking these containers apart that have been designed specifically to ensure uh, that we have sealed up all biology that might be contained within the samples or any of the inherent dust that accumulated on the, on the hardware as we acquired the samples and sent them in orbit. All right. Um, and a question for Rick, sort of a related question. Uh, planetary protection becomes a lot more complicated when we start sending people to Mars. Um, what's the thinking for how to do that to both protect the astronauts and protect, uh, preserve the science that they will do once they get there? Uh, so that's a great question and thank you. Um, so I have a couple of points. Um, uh, we, we need to learn to manage it. Human beings, a significant part of our mass is our microbial populations. Um, that's what we evolved from and that's what that's still with us. And, there, and we are going to have to learn to manage those releases and they're going to be releases. We saw in the Mare Space Station, we had a depressurization and we've had major incidences in, in human spaceflight. And so we have habitats leaking or whatever. And so part of this is actually recognizing it, and then two is managing it. Um, and then uh, so understanding how winds carry stuff down. So in Antarctica, they actually do this. They worry about the prevailing winds so that they can keep clean areas for doing research uh, up, upwind and, or further away so that they can actually get the research done. And that's the uh, forward piece that you mentioned. Um, and, and we should actually say that we shouldn't always view humans being there as a problem either, right? And the reason I, I, th I would push on this is that, you know, a human with a drill is going, or that has the versatility that an astrobiologist period brings, if she's there on the surface of Mars, their ability to find stuff, just like having Jack Schmidt on Apollo 17, goes through the roof. And so the, having that creativity, that versatility, all those things that humans bring to the equation actually may help us speed up the search for life and that we have to manage the risk. And then the next risk is the backward piece that you talked about, which is really critical. And it's really not the Earth that I'm worried about more. I'm more worried about the crew getting exposed to things, you know, and because they're the first human beings to encounter it. Um, and so we have to really think about, you know, we have to understand it through missions like this MSR campaign as best we can and through all the other things. And then we have to take manage those risks in a way to try to minimize it, uh, the to overall risk of the crew. Um, and be mindful that they're eventually coming home too. So it's, there's a lot of work to be done, but there are actually a lot of opportunities too there that I, I frankly excite me in terms of uh, advancing the search for life. All right, great. Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about international cooperation in terms of NASA and ESA cooperating on Mars sample return. Um, what about cooperation with other countries? Uh, many, you know, um, 
some of which are, are launching Mars missions this year, like the UAE and China, uh, but also what roles do you see potentially for the private sector for enabling some of these applications? I look at some of these missions that are being thought to support Mars exploration, uh, like a ice mapper mission or, or communications mission um, being something that a, a private company could do um, just as easily as NASA. I'll take a stab at that. The, uh... You know, first of all, we have international involvement in almost all of our Mars activities. And Mars 2020 has a complement of instruments on board, many of which have elements that uh, have been provided by other nations. But the, uh, uh, in terms of the overall new missions going to the Mars right now, you mentioned the uh, United Arab Emirates has an orbiter going that is going to help uh, advance our understanding of the atmosphere and constituents of the atmosphere. And to profile that, we are working together to provide them with the communications uh, support necessary for their mission and have been advising them on the, on the mission design and their preparation for operating the mission. Uh, we're really excited about China joining the fleet at Mars. And I really uh, do believe that the exploration of another planet, the planet that uh, most, most people would feel has the highest probability of eventually supporting uh, human life there is is intrinsically uh, an international endeavor. So uh, I really look forward to uh, to seeing the China mission unfold, and I uh, hope someday that we'll get to uh, we'll get to collaborate with them on future activities. In terms of the private sector, um, you know the we have been turning as an agency to leverage the evolution of capabilities and interests in the private sector. You see that in human spaceflight, uh, very apparent in, in the recent DM2 launch there. And I think Mars exploration will be accelerated uh, by growing interest to uh, participate in that venture. And the broader the the community that participates in Mars exploration, and the greater the opportunities that are open, and for Rick mentioned the fact that once we have a, a communication infrastructure that's a little more friendly in place, it makes it easier uh, for lower cost orbiters and lower cost landers to enter into the activities. And that'll only expand. Uh, it, it sort of uh, accelerates as we get all of these, these different entities working together and bringing their interests and applying them. So I'm, I'm really excited of, of what's happening uh, later in the 2020s. Uh, I also uh, should mention that JAXA has a uh, uh, sample return mission from uh, the Mars movies planned uh, in the same time period in the mid 20s. So very exciting times. Hey Jim, if I can jump in here, I I, uh, <clears throat> I think there's got to be a message uh, from you to people that are in the outer planets looking for a life in Europa and Enceladus. I mean, again, this has been multi-decades of exploring Mars. Do you have any, any message to the outer planet people? This is obviously a, not an easy task to do to search for life. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's certainly not a hunt and peck activity, is it, Leonard? <laughs> so um, I think what we've learned at Mars has come out of the long systematic approaches and the continuity between the missions to really focus on something to understand the environment, its evolution, its current condition, um, and all those things and how they tie together. So exploration for life at Mars anywhere um, is a long, uh, hard slog, but it's extremely uh, stimulating and interesting. Uh, it promotes uh, advancement of technology as well as science and under our understanding of place in the, in the universe. So. Um, patience, I think, is probably the biggest word that has to be attached to it. Uh, no one mission is going gonna, is gonna to satisfy uh, our curiosity. <laughs> I saw a couple of questions here, probably um, specific to Mars 2020 for Ken. Uh, one of them was... Um, you know, you're going to put these samples in the sample tubes and caching them on the surface. How long um, could those um, samples remain in those tubes on the surface if there's some delay in picking them up, um, you know, before either, you know, uh, heating or exposure to the elements in general um, would affect their viability? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And one that we grappled with early on um, when we were designing the mission, we were not sure uh, if and when sample return would happen. And so we, we designed the sample tubes to stay secure for the samples to be undegraded for decades. That's both on the surface of Mars while they're awaiting uh, a pickup and also potentially um, uh, on, on orbit at, at Mars. And actually the image that uh, Brian just put up, you can see the, the sample tube, that's the white thing on the left-hand side and, the, and what the core looks like that goes in it. Um, these tubes will sit, uh, they're, they're sealed. There's a plug put in the end and they are hermetically sealed. And then they can sit on Mars or they can sit in orbit for decades without degradation. On the right-hand side of this image, you actually see the, uh, the, the system for manipulating the samples through the uh, sealing process in, on board the rover. It's a very elaborate uh, mechanism uh, to ensure that the samples are uh, both present in the tube, we would hate to bring back tubes that are empty, uh, and also to seal it up uh, against any gas exchange. All right, great. Uh, and then another question, you know, the focus obviously for Perseverance is going to be caching those samples, perhaps delivering um, some of them to the, the lander later on. Uh, you know, we've seen with a lot of other previous rover missions, that they're very long lived. Um, they well exceed their, their lives. What sort of thinking have you done so far about a potential extended mission? What else could you do with Perseverance uh, once you get that prime mission of caching the samples done? Yeah, we, we thought a lot about that, and I and I feel obligated to you know just say we are tested for a, a, a finite amount of time, and uh, that's the that's the period in which we are confident that we can survive. And for us, that's uh, that's uh, uh, three Earth years. Uh, if we are fortunate enough to have an extended mission, um, we in the when we were doing the landing site selection process, uh, we identified a very interesting opportunity, uh, which is a little like um, Curiosity climbing Mount Sharp. That is that we could uh, explore the units of the crater floor, like the delta, and uh, and then drive up the crater rim uh, into the highlands that surround the crater. And interestingly, during the landing site selection process, uh, the, the the kind of uh, showdown between two different sites, they're actually close enough together that um, we can't actually get from one to the other, but we can get from uh, yeah. If you can go to the to the uh, image showing the delta. Um, so so the, the idea is that we can actually investigate the same geology that was present at a, a strong, yeah, up on the, up on the left hand, yeah, on the left hand side there, um, uh, just to the left of where the canyon comes in. Uh, the, the notional uh, goal, if we're fortunate to have the extended mission, is to rove up onto those highlands. Lots of really interesting rocks up there. And as I was getting at, they were also, um, rocks that are very similar to those that were of the, of the second most strongly favored landing site. So it's, it's sort of miraculous we can, uh, you know, knock off two birds with one stone with this mission. Uh, question, I think, uh, for Rick, I mean, one of the big issues for human exploration of Mars is um, radiation, protecting crews from radiation. Um, what have we learned and, and what do we need to learn with future missions in terms of what the radiation environment is on Mars, or for that matter, any other related hazards um, that we'd want to study um, either with spacecraft at Mars or with samples that we bring back um, before we send a human mission? Uh, so the radiation question is a great, great question. Um, I would say that on the surface of Mars, the radiation exposure, because you have the planet blocking, there's two sources of radiation, as you know. There's the, uh, there's the radiation coming from our sun, and then there's the radiation coming in from deep space, which is galactic cosmic radiation. Um, when you're on the surface of Mars, you not only have an atmosphere, even though it's then helping attenuate radiation, but the the body of the planet itself at night blocks the, uh, the radiation coming from our sun. And so generally speaking, that radiation, that overall radiation level is on the order of being like on the space station is the word our medical guys tell us. Bigger problem is radiation in, the, in space in transit um, because then you do not have those protections and there, uh, there are ways to mitigate that. 
on the planet if we're there for a long time. There are lots of really clever ideas on how to mitigate it. Um, so, for example, you can take dirt and your water supplies, a combination of dirt and water supplies, uh, the two together, actually, because they're different types of energetic particles, actually provide a lot of protection. Uh, there is some really cool architectural work being done right now uh, through the United Arab Emirates, actually, where they're looking at having people sleep underground, but then come, then they have the rest of the habitat, for example, up above, because no one wants to live underground forever. And so thinking about these sort of creative out-of-the-box ways is really key to, uh, to doing it. I would say the other big hazard, um, well, let me back it up, and in terms of managing that, there's generally a, a feeling uh, that we are, can handle that and that really it becomes a cancer mitigation issue for when the crews return. Um, and there's some very interesting work being done in the pharmaceutical world to actually help reduce that, which will obviously have uh, spinoff effects for everybody else on this planet. The other big risk that I uh, worry about personally is this whole issue of dust and the potentially and how you manage that in terms of breathing. As If you look at the Apollo crew members when they were – actually returned from the moon, they were covered in that stuff um, and they were breathing it. And we need to really understand how we manage that more effectively. So our activities at the moon will ha definitely help inform that in terms of the suits we design to work in those environments, the rovers they hop into and then hopping into modules and making sure we really know how to do that. And that will teach us a lot about how to do it at Mars in all probability. All right. Uh, we're coming up at the uh, end of the hour, but I want to see if Leonard had uh, any more questions he wanted to ask. I guess for Rick, you know, it, it's it, it's interesting that we were at an epic moment here launching a new rover, the potential of humans on Mars. Um, what's your forecast for how many missions of humans on Mars may uh, be uh, on the books? And where does that leave us? I mean, we all, it's easy to write multi-planetary species and all, you know, the buzzwords that we use, but what's your view of, uh, of the destiny of, of humans on Mars? Where does that really foothold give us? Uh, literally, I love that question. be philosophical and wear white robes, I guess, but. <laughs> yeah. So I spent a lot of my career working on the space station. And when we first started it, we had, you know, I think people probably were thinking similar thing. How long would it last? You know, that kind of thing. You know, Jim already talked about Mars is not going to be done by one nation or one space agency. It's going to be done by an amazing collaboration that we're already seeing evolving. We work with a group called the International Mars Exploration Working, and there are 26 space agencies that are all doing stuff aimed at Mars right now. And when we send humans, it's going to be that on steroids. And so learning how to build those relationships and do that, you know, I think that when you get that infrastructure in it, the cost to any given co one country can be can managed. Um, but that if you really put that kind of energy and creativity in it, well, hopefully we're shooting for a more permanent presence like we have achieved in low Earth orbit, you know, and, and it really becomes our second planet. Um, and so that's a that's a maybe a sweeping statement, but I think all of us who have really – you know, been thinking about, and there's a lot of us, you know, as you, you're one, all of you are one of them, right? You know, they really, if you're going to make that step, ultimately, you know, that won't be what we do initially. We'll initially be trying to get the toehold there. Maybe there'll be short stays until we learn to manage and live successfully in that environment. But eventually, you know, we're, I, I personally believe we're heading towards a real presence on, on the second planet. Thank you. <clears throat> Great. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Brian and thank everybody for participating. Unfortunately, we've got way more questions than we can fit into uh, to an hour long webcast, which just shows uh, how interesting of a topic this is and how interested people are in the Perseverance rover and the opportunity to bring samples back from Mars and eventually send uh, astronauts to Mars. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to all of our panelists. Thanks to Leonard for hosting such a great conversation today. I um, want to let everybody know that uh, a replay of this webinar will be posted to spacenews.com just as soon as we're able to get it down from the cloud and then get it back up for you to watch it. I'll see what we can do uh, to get make the slides available to uh, some folks in the audience who had uh, 
trouble seeing those. Um, but again, thanks everybody for this webinar. We do hope to come back to you in the next couple of weeks with a, a follow-up webinar, uh, look, taking a closer look at some of the um, international efforts underway uh, to, to get to the red planet. Um, there's a great slide from Rick's um, presentation that we haven't shown, but I think it's a good, I think it's a good closing slide for everybody. Mars is a human effort. I think that pretty much says it all. Um, if, if, if humanity is going to become uh, a multi-planet species, if we're going to make it to Mars, it's going to take more than just NASA. And I think uh, that point was made very clearly today. Once again, thanks a lot for Space News. Uh, hope to see you back here next time. Goodbye.